To make you cry I'll never be more loved Than I am right now Ooh. Going through a storm But I won't go down I hear your voice Carried in the rhythm of the wind To call me out You would cross an ocean So I wouldn't try
Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Good to be in the house of God on tonight. Man, what a wonderful service we had this morning. Good night. The presence of the Lord was so incredibly powerful in this place. And uh, I feel like the Lord spoke to us through the word of God in a great way today. How many of y'all are glad the Avenger is coming? Amen. And he is going to make it all right. But we're here tonight ready to see what the Lord has in store for us. We got so many out sick, and, and we just want to continue to pray for them. Just, man, we really need to make this a serious matter of prayer. All this sickness has got to go in the name of the Lord. If it's not COVID, it's a stomach virus. If it's not a stomach virus, it's something else. We got to just get this off off of God's people and uh, ask God just to heal and deliver. I swear, I think they spray this stuff in the air. I really do. I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist at heart, but I, I do believe that something crazy is going on here. All of a sudden, all this junk just, just pops up out of nowhere. I mean, where's it been all year? And then, oh, here we are. So we want to pray that God would heal. I know Brother Earl is not feeling well tonight, so we want to pray for him. Um, we got Sister Michaela. She's not feeling well. Uh, Sister Sean is not feeling well. Um, Brother Calvin, of course, he's out with his uh, leg situation going on. Uh, but then Michelle and her family are not feeling well. Uh, I'm trying to think. I know there's a Sister Lydia has got a severe headache, uh, severe migraine. Um, she, Brother Jimmy did talk to me before I came to church tonight and said one of her eyes, uh, the vision is restored in it. So just keep praying for her. Jeremiah's out sick. Um, Lord in heaven, that's just too much. That's it. I, I told Sister Shonda, I know we're going to start service here in a minute, but I got to say that. I told Sister Shonda, I said, I honestly cannot wait for the day when every, I, I'm talking, I'm going to walk in here one Sunday and all you guys that lay out ain't going to be laying out and everybody that's sick ain't going to be sick and we're all going to come in here at one time together and this place is going to be packed to the hill. I mean, we had a good crowd this morning and all kinds of folks out. I cannot wait to see it. Um, Isaac and Jess are doing better. Jackson is doing better. Um, they're just waiting for Isaac's test to come back. Um, so they have to quarantine until his test come back. Um, but we want to continue to pray for them. Brother Brent, have you heard anything from him? I, I messaged him today and I haven't heard him. You didn't, oh, you didn't hear anything from him? Okay. All right, so we're going to continue to pray for Brother Brent. I know uh, Sister Sandy that's been coming, she is sick as well. We want to pray for her. Man, this is just enough is enough. Enough is enough. This is crazy. Amen. Yeah, we need to start drinking life sauce. I'm, I'm just playing. No, I'm, not, I'm joking. We don't really need to do that. I'm joking. Listen, do not. I was playing. Somebody's going to say, I heard this preacher in Kings Point. Amen. Maybe, maybe we'll get famous off that. I don't know. No, don't drink life sauce. That's a bad idea. But we want to pray tonight before we get started that God would touch the sick. God would heal them. I mean, we need a move of God. It is still in the scripture that by his stripes we are healed. So I believe that, and I don't believe that that's metaphorical. I do believe that's literal. I believe that we are healed by the Lord's stripes. And so let's just pray tonight that God would just touch the sick and heal them in a mighty way. Father God, God, in the mighty name of Jesus, everyone that can stand, let's stand, go before the Lord, God, touch and heal, Lord, deliver, God, Father, we pray for every name that has been mentioned, and those, God, that maybe we failed to mention, God, that you would heal them and strengthen them, God, touch their bodies, Lord, we miss seeing them in the house of God. Lord, you want your house full, Lord. You send your servants out, God, to the highways and to the hedges to compel them to come. That your house might be full, oh God. I do not believe it is your will, God, to see all of this sickness among us, God. For Lord God, you said you would not allow the diseases of Egypt to come upon your people. And Lord, we're asking you to honor us, oh God, in the same way you honored Israel, God. Lord, cut these things off from us, oh God. Lord, take us spiritually into the land of Goshen, God, to where none of these plagues will anymore come nigh us, oh God. Father, we want to serve you. We want to live for you. We want to walk before you, God. Oh, Jesus, make a way, oh God. Make a way, oh God, and heal your people. Father, touch, deliver, strengthen. Father, make a way, oh God. 
Be with us tonight in a mighty way, God. Strengthen us, help us, heal us, God. Encourage us, challenge us, change us, oh God. Let the will of God be done in this place as it is in the heavens, oh Lord. And for it, we're going to give you praise, glory, and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's worship God, saints.
uh, this morning's message was just so on time. It was just so on time. I think sometimes the enemy, he wants to pound us down. He wants to take us out and... And I think sometimes we think it's just about us, but it's not just about us. It's not just about us throwing in the towel. He doesn't want just us. The enemy plays for keeps and he don't play by the rules. He, if he can get us so discouraged, so beat down, so distracted, so destroyed, so oppressed, then we'll never witness again. We'll never testify. We'll never shout. We'll lose our praise. Hallelujah. And we, we sure will never walk in our calling. But I'm just so thankful that I, this morning I was thinking after church that it's like being in an octagon and how you fight and the Lord teaches you defense. And I feel like so much I've got my hands up and I'm in defense mode and he's just hitting and he's knocking and it's each hit and hit and hit. And I remember the pastor's message not giving any ground. And I may not be losing ground, but... I think sometimes he's just knocking and, and I imagined in my mind how he has us so oppressed or has me so beat down, just trying to rob me of my witness, my shout, my praise. And I could imagine in my mind of him having his hands around my neck and being on the ground. And as soon as you want to open your eyes, it's like another jab, another hit. And now you think you're getting above it. You think you're coming out. And here he comes with one more hit, one more jab. But I, I think the Lord's like, put you have to have aggression in your spirit. Be um, aggressive. And uh, just, sorry, I'm... I'm just so thankful the Holy Ghost won't let you give up. I remember those years ago when I went to Johnson City and he filled me with the Spirit. Every fragmented piece went back together. And ever since then, I may get down. The enemy just jabbing and beating me like a punching bag. But there's something inside saying, get up. Get up and keep going because you've come too far now to lay down and die. If you've got to be on defense, if you can't be on offense right now, but you're not giving up any ground because I brought you too far. I'm going to stand on defense. I don't care if I have to keep my hands up. The enemy wants to get you in the octagon and have you running around. I always watch UFC and how the other guy would always be running around to try to get you to run around. To get you to run around I always thought why does not he just go up to him and just fight him and I think that's how the enemy does to get us distracted or get us wore down and um, I don't know why I said all that but I'm just so thankful for the message this morning that one day hallelujah it's going to be tap out for the enemy it's going to be lights out when that round and that bell rings hallelujah I volunteer and and just and um and then I went in the back. I worked out front, but I also got my hands on the back. So I went in the back and I came back and this this lady gave me a hundred dollars in my hand and I said, well, uh, okay, I'll put it in our donation jar. You know, in my hand. And she said, no, it's not for you. I said, she gave it for me. <laughs> so I said, okay, well. I'll take it, and um, and then the next, and so I went in the, in the building to put it in my purse, but my purse wasn't in a drawer, but I thought it, it you know, was hidden, you know, it wasn't about to be put in the building, you know, and so I said, well, I'll tell my husband about this when I get home, but I didn't tell him when I got home because for whatever reason, <laughs> 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 and so the next day when I So I think someone 
I took it at work, and, and we have, you know, we have community service workers there besides, you know, the regular volunteers. And uh, we got cameras and everything, but uh, my boss never said she would, but, you know, she knew it was. But I'm just so honored that God so fit <laughs> to send someone my way and give it to me. He didn't want the old lady to have it. She wanted me to have it. She waited until I came back outside, you know, to to give me the money, and I just want to praise God, because one day, you know, this is going to happen again. <laughs> <laughs> and the next time, I'll take better care of you. You know, okay, I'll, I got to confess to there a little bit, everybody else, and, and, you know, I might have just a little bit of scripture I, I might read, but that's all right, you know, since it's going this way. I feel the Spirit leading me to maybe go ahead and talk about it, but, and, you know, the pastor and I and, and uh, David and Jonathan, we had a meeting today, and I confessed, I confessed up to David here a couple weeks ago after his last sermon that I was, you know, probably the worst, world's worst procrastinator in the world and I've been studying for a while you know some scriptures some scriptures and 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 it, it goes beyond the procrastination but the, the Lord laid it on the pastor's heart to, to give us some instruction today and and to and a little bit of it was about when the Lord gives you a, uh, a message that you don't absolutely have to use it then and uh, so I've been sitting back and sitting back on these uh, certain scriptures because uh, <clears throat> a while back, uh, I'm just going to go up here and i got some scripture. I, I believe it's important to us. I've seen several young people here and, and the devil try to lead you every which way but where God wants you to go. So, and, and as far as being a team, you know, this goes along with my testimony. Uh, you know, Jess... Said a prior uh, during a time of both of our lives that you know you wouldn't uh, look at either one of us maybe as being fit for the kingdom of God, but uh, God led us together and and we use that to our advantage every day. The, the power of God we use that to our advantage uh, here on earth. Amen. I don't believe that God, as scriptures as we'll discuss here in a minute, wants us to be unhappy here on this earth. Uh, praise God. He said, he said he wants us to, uh, his kingdom to come to us. I don't believe there's no sadness. I don't believe there's no arguments. I don't believe there's no fighting amongst the uh, husbands and wives, uh, amongst uh, the brothers and sisters. Uh, uh, there's just none of it there, okay? God wants us to live heavenly here, heavenly, right here on earth. We got to prepare for it. I believe that. As I hear that song over and over, Amazing Grace, amen. 10,000 years, we've no less days, amen, to sing God's praise uh, than we do right now, Sister Hannah. Uh, we need to start getting used to it uh, right now, amen. Living like we're in heaven here on earth. And I know uh, the pastor's been hitting on this in a while, but it is my scripture and the other things that led me to go ahead and go through with this message tonight is on marriage and and of not marriage and and relationships and, and and this that and the other. What kind of relationship we're supposed to have with the world? What kind of relationships we're supposed to look for in people? Even I'm not the best on marriage. I promise you, I've had failed marriages. 
but God uses me in my circumstances that I've had in my life to help others. We have got to focus on helping others in a certain point that God has allowed us or that we went through in our lives to bring glory to God. All right? So I'm sorry, hon. I don't know where I'm supposed to go for you because I don't know your thoughts and your mind. But <laughs> you want to throw it off on me. Maybe as the Lord tell me, just go ahead and get up and, and get the word out tonight. Amen. Amen. We need the word. It's, we need the word to deliver us from everyday battles, from everyday uh, 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 tasks that we're going to, to uh, receive from the Lord. Amen. Uh, the Lord will give us tasks to do, and we have to prepare ourselves uh, by studying the word of God. Amen. And growing in the word of God and accepting the word of God in our lives. Amen. When we accept it, we will apply it to our everyday life. Amen. Genesis is where I'm going to start tonight. In the Genesis chapter 2, I believe. And, and to get this up to where we are, the, 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 the Lord, you know, all creation has been created. We know that uh, through, uh, since we've been young in school or uh, from now on, we know that God uh, created the earth, right? All right. Well, we want to talk tonight about how he created. Listen, he planted a garden in the Garden of Eden. We know that, right? And and just to get us up to where he created, placed the man. We, he went through and he placed everything within this garden uh, that they needed to survive. Right. Amen. I want us tonight to look at the church as the garden. Amen. He, he has planted everything as the pastor has been preaching on the body. He has planted everything uh, within the church uh, to help us survive. Amen. Uh, to help us survive in life uh, no matter uh, what life situation brings us. Uh, he has prepared, amen, and supplied our need right here uh, within the body of Christ and within God's people. I believe that. Listen, hey, if you read, I'm not going to read it all uh, to up to verse 15, but it describes that everything you need, nuggets of gold was coming out of these rivers, my friend. Nuggets, you could just reach down and reach up and grab a nugget of gold, and there was your supply of money. Amen. I want to tell you, there's options like that in the church today. Amen. Other things that we need, other things that we can go forth for uh, is right in the body of Christ. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, it's the truth. It's here. Everything we need is within the body of Christ. Everything, every circumstance that we come up against, God has supplied an answer through his word and through his people uh, to supply us uh, with the need that we need uh, during that moment. You read the word of God and you'll see that that's true. But I'm going to start in verse 15. And it's just, uh, the Lord, I, I have the, Get back to my testimony a little bit. I, I have a burning desire now, it seems like, for marriages because, uh, uh, you know, I have placed marriages at a very low standard for a long time, for a very long time. But you know what? Listen to me. You need to teach your kids the importance of marriage, and, and, and you have to teach them uh, the psychological effect that it can have on them going through a divorce. All right, listen, it's, it's more than just a simple divorce, but this thing can affect your brain uh, and it can affect your thoughts uh, to where you can get out of control. You, If you allow things to keep affecting your mind and keep uh, uh, taunting your mind, it can get out of control. But divorce, it will do a number on your mind and on your children's minds. So we have to teach them the effects and the importance of not only just be, by being godly, uh, but the effects that it's going to have on our children if they don't uh, succeed, succeed in marriage. Amen. I just want to go over a few things that God, uh, because here a while back my sister-in-law was going to get married, and, and they needed, they, or they wanted, uh, they had the opportunity to do marriage counseling and, and get a discount on their marriage license. Hey, praise God. Come on with the government. If they give them the opportunity for me to, to share with a couple the word of God and, and a way to provide them with a successful marriage, hey, 
Bring it on, government. You give them all the discounts you want and send them my way. I will teach them a little bit of what I know about marriage and common principles of marriage and the do's and don'ts of marriage because I know plenty of those. All right. Listen. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden as its gardener, as its gardener to tend and care for it. But the Lord gave the man this warning, you may eat every fruit of the garden except fruit from the tree of consciousness. For it, listen, I'm sorry, I apologize, I'm reading from the Living Bible. I apologize. For its, uh, for its fruit will open your eyes to make you aware of the right, of right and wrong, good and bad. If you eat its fruit, you will be doomed to die. All right, listen. Now, we got to realize in our marriage, amen, that we got to uh, uh, not to seek after that worldly knowledge. Amen. I believe that's where we, we mess up and we seek after everything that's got to do with the world instead of after the spiritual things. And we, and we find ourselves and our marriage a dying and going down the drain. Amen. If we focus, uh, I will go hit other scriptures to back this up here in a minute, but we need to put our focus, amen, on godly things, amen, and godly situations, and godly conversations in our marriages, amen, and depend on God alone and the uh, scripture alone uh, to, to beat the devil when he comes after us. Amen. We need to depend on him and quit uh, uh, focusing on uh, the worldly things that's going, you think that's going to make you happy in a marriage. It's, called, it's hard. I know that I understand that it's, uh, we're in a, a stage of this world uh, that it's hard uh, not to let our kids focus on uh, uh, worldly things that make them happy in life. Amen. Uh, but we need to uh, steer them more uh, toward happiness uh, in the Lord. Amen. Uh, we need to teach them this at a young age. Uh, we need to encourage them at a young age. Amen. Uh, to seek after a godly girlfriend. Amen. A godly boyfriend. Amen. A godly people. Amen. To run around with. Not, God, not that we're controlling them. Amen. But we're teaching them. Amen. We're teaching them right from wrong. Amen. A godly way versus the worldly way. We have to supply them with the examples of what's going to happen if they get into a relationship and they don't do the things that God expects them to do during a marriage. You know, parents are, are too uh, reliant on uh, pe other people teaching them uh, what they need to be teaching their children. They, they rely on the schools. Uh, they rely on uh, the Internet or whatever the means may be, uh, but they avoid uh, teaching their kids about the things of this world and the harms of it or the benefits of what they do or don't do. Amen. We want our influence to be godly. We want to take it upon ourselves and, and take that step and take up that role. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I wish I'd have done things different with my kids, but it's too late for that now. But I can give you examples throughout my testimonies, and over the years you'll learn and see. I can't get it all in, in tonight. I can't fit it all in tonight. But you'll see why I do know just a little bit about this. And I, and I somewhat have a, compa a passion, for it, compassion for it now because of how I see God working in mine and my wife's relationship and know that it works and knows that it works and you and you avoid uh, problems i see a lot of these shows uh, on tv uh, and they'll have these problems as creative problems you know everything's going good but to hype up the show they have these creative problems <laughs> and, and you know whoo Hey, stay away from creative problems because if we follow the word of god amen we're not going to have those problems because we won't be creating them we need to stay away from creating problems. And the Lord, let's see. Okay, verse 18. And the Lord God said, It isn't good for man to be alone. I will make a companion for him, a helper uh, suited to his needs. So the Lord God formed from the soil every kind of animal, bird, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever he called them, that was their name. But still 
there was no proper helper for the man. For then the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the place from which he had removed it. I know this has probably been used a lot, but, uh, you know, he, he took the, from the rib that uh, was right next to the heart. Uh, he didn't take it from the foot uh, where he stomped down, or, you know, he didn't take it from up here where we was all in the mind control and all that, but, you know, he took that rib right from the, close to the heart. Amen. Where we'd be close to our, our spouses, and, and we would have a, a close to the, a knit ship there, amen, to, to, to the other part of us. Uh, I know it's probably been used like that, but I, I caught that from somebody and it stuck with me. They, they took it right here, right straight from the heart, you know, right close to the heart uh, where, you, where you have your feeling and your being. Remove that. He made the rib into a woman, verse 22, and brought, and brought her to the man. This is it, Adam exclaimed. She is part of my own bone and flesh. Her, her name is woman because she was taken out of a man. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife in such a way that the two become one person. Amen. You know, it's time. Uh, there comes a time in life that a, that a young man has to leave his, his mom and dad and go out and be his own man and, 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 and create his own family. Uh, you know, we need to teach our kids that way. We need to teach them. Uh, we need to prepare them uh, for the future. We need to, uh, to explain to them that there's steps in taking and growing up. And, you know, I, I know this is bullying all over what the pastor has been teaching, even to our single people, people uh, that uh, they... Uh, the boys and kids need a, a adult leadership. Adult leadership that's not involved uh, in having a TV in front of them or having somebody uh, to tell them the wrong things. But we need to get into the Word of God, amen, and teach them that they're supposed to be man and woman at some time and they're going to have to start growing up uh, at an early age. Uh, we got to start teaching them uh, to take on young manly responsibilities uh, so that the, when they uh, grow up uh, that they won't be lacking and leaving the woman to do everything and uh, be able to provide uh, for the family and for their, uh, uh, for their children and for their wives. We have to uh, learn it and find a way uh, to teach these children how to survive in life. Hey Amen. We've got to start teaching these uh, the children a way to provide for themselves and to teach them uh, that, that sometimes uh, we're not going to be able to just take it and drop it off at the place to have the repairs done, uh, but they might have to do a repair themselves. Hey Amen. But we got to uh, uh, start teaching the children that they're going to have to start moving away and start stop being so dependent is what I think I was trying to say is quit being so dependent on the parent and kind of pushing them out. Uh, you know, the eagles and stuff, they'll, they'll push their kids out when it's time to go. Uh, we need to stop hanging on uh, to that relationship uh, that we've built and that, that the parents sometimes uh, depend on their relationship. And we need, to, we need to start being that again. And, and I believe we start seeing more success in our, uh, our marriages, you know. And I hear so many times, uh, well, I'll just go back and stay with my mom. I'll just go back to my mom. I'll just go back to my dad's. And, and, and they have that crutch there because they feel like that every time that something goes wrong, they can just run back to mom and dad's. All right. That's, that's, I think that's uh, dangerous lines there. I mean, it's, it's all right to be kids or friends with our kids, uh, but to to base that relationship solely on you want to be loved by your child because you do the things that they do, we can't do that. We, we have to be parents. All right. But that, that, that I want you want to see this line. is Everything that was in this Garden of Eden was provided for their survival. Their survival. We need to look for the church for our survival of our marriages and our relationships that we're in. Uh, the relationship that we may get into, we need to look to the church for our needs in that relationship. Because I believe that God has provided the same way that he has since the beginning of the time. 
He has provided a way for us uh, to to be successful. I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't believe that God intends for us to be unsuccessful or unhappy. It's, a, it's just no place to be when we're unhappy in life. It's miserable. I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Good. Verse 14 says, Don't be tamed with those who do not love the Lord. For what do the people of God have in common with the people of sin? How can light live with darkness? And what harmony can there be between Christ and the devil? How can a Christian be a partner with one who doesn't believe? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For you are God's temple, uh, the home of, of the living God. And you, and God has said of you, I will live in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That is why the Lord has said, leave them separate yourselves, separate yourselves from them. Don't touch their filthy things, and I will welcome you and be a father uh, to you and will will be my sons and daughters. Listen, I want you to listen. If you're out there and you're young, especially, I want you to listen to me uh, about this subject right here, about being unequally yoked uh, with uh, unbelievers or people of the world. We got to keep ourselves separate from them. We got to be, if we're searching for a girlfriend, if we have that desire for a boyfriend, we need to look uh, at a godly partner. Amen. It's easy to, to, to fail, I mean, fall back and, and look into the world. Uh, sometimes it seems like, I'm sure for single people, uh, that it seems like there's never going to be a godly man or woman uh, that's going to come along uh, for that person. Uh, but it, uh, it's not worth uh, sacrificing, amen, uh, to the, uh, sacrificing to the opportunity daughter of this world, amen, to go to a, a, a worldly man or a worldly woman, amen, that when we're searching for somebody, uh, we need to make sure, and if we can't find a worldly man or a worldly woman uh, that fits our needs, amen, we need to just stop looking, amen, and accept that where God has placed us, that's where we are in life, amen. We need to, uh, to, and also I believe we need to focus uh, after we get married, amen, having these same types of relationships, amen, that with, uh, or, or single men and women uh, that goes out with people uh, during the night or whatever to have fun, uh, that we can't uh, have uh, ourselves uh, joining together uh, with people that is of the world, amen. It's too easy uh, for it to rub off on you, amen. Our children, it's too easy for it to rub off on our children uh, to make an impression on their heart, amen, before uh, the word of God as a test to really seek in and take root, amen, and grow, amen. The world will come in and destroy the young people's, amen, desire uh, to be in the house of God, amen, the desire uh, to seek God's face, amen, and wipe it out of their little minds, amen. I remember I was a young kid uh, going to church on a regular basis, uh, uh, but at a certain point I was allowed, amen, to go and to be with other uh, worldly people, amen, uh, worldly friends, uh, a worldly girlfriend. And guess where I ended up, Brother David? Amen. Was right in the world. Amen. We have to prepare our children, amen, for the, the, the right things. Well, we don't, well, listen to me. It is worth it. Amen. I just will not, I wasn't taught this, brothers and sisters. This is brought up in church. I said my whole life, but I was not taught this. Listen, I'm glad the way my life has turned out. I'm glad the things I went through had given me something to share with somebody else. But, but, listen, I wouldn't want my children to go through what I've gone through to get where I've been. I wouldn't want my children to go through what I went through to get where I am now. I don't want your children to go through what I went through to get where I am right now. It should be easier. It is. It's possible, brothers and sisters, to be easier on their minds and on their on their uh, wallet, on their finances, everything to follow God's guidelines uh, to marriage. Amen. I suffer the consequences of it now, but I want to try to encourage you to stay on top of who your kids are hanging out with, 
who your kids are socializing with. Amen. That they're not getting that wrong seed implanted in their head. And even in their own lives. Amen. I, I, I used to think that I could go and be a minister unto people that, that it went through the things that I did just right after I got out of it. Uh, we can't be yoked with the, the worldly people, amen, and, and try to serve God at the same time. It just don't work, amen. Uh, God's unhappy with it, amen. He won't allow it to go on, amen, and it, it'll stop, and then you'll be right stuck in the world. Praise God. He won't allow it to go on. He won't allow you uh, to be uh, amongst the sinners and try to live a godly life. Amen. He won't bless that. He won't bless it. And he won't bless it if you allow your children to do it in the same aspect. We need to warn them of it. We need to tell them the dangers of it. And if they don't see and, 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 and heed to those warnings, we need to just put a stop to what they're doing. We are still their parents. We still are their parents. We need to take control of what we do. I know... Uh, I, like I said, I failed in this, but it's it from experience that I want to share with you the importance of what it can do to you. It will lead to drug abuse. It will lead to alcohol abuse. Amen. It will lead to never st uh, holding a high value on marriage. Uh, come on now. I just want to tell you a little bit of the worldly aspect of it, of what it does to people, how it can destroy you. It, it led me into that. So brothers and sisters, it led me in, a uh, bad marriage led me in to using alcohol, using drugs, amen, and then none of it ever met up to what I was looking for, amen. I was looking for, as a child, I was looking for that godly relationship that a man and God, a woman had, but I always took it upon myself. I never depended on God, amen, to lead me in the right direction, and I ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time and with the wrong person, amen, and it ruined my life. It ran me down the wrong road of using alcohol and drugs, amen, and going out and being with other women and not caring about what God's word said to it. It ruined me in a way. The simple thing is marriage is very important in life. It will ruin your mentality if you let it, amen. We got to be prepared. We got to be prepared, Amen. Thank you, Lord. He said, and, and one thing other than this, you know, the psalmist said, he said, when thou seek my, will seek thou my face. Listen, we got to be about God seeking God's face, right? And, and if you are equally yoked with a man and a woman, you're going to be both seeking that same thing. Hey, Amen. It's not going to be pulling one, it's pulled back this way, man. But you're going to be both focused on the kingdom of God. And what a, what a glorious, joyful trip that is to, to be able to walk together with somebody that you're equally yoked with. Amen. And some of the same line with you, and same page with you, thinking the same things. Amen. Agreeing upon the same things. You're, you're looking towards the same thing. Amen. There's going to be way less argument. And, Arguments and, and controversy in the marriage when you're focused on the same thing. Amen. Let's see. Second Timothy 6, chapter 6, and verse 17. Tell those who are, listen, young people, focus your thoughts on God. It's all right to be able to make a living, but this money thing will, will distract you, all right? Listen to where you put your investment. I want to teach you where to put an investment tonight, all right? Everybody's good about investments. We want to invest, invest tonight. Tell those who are rich not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which will soon be gone, but their pride and trust should be in the living God who always richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. Tell them to use their money to do good. They should be rich in good works and should give happily to those in need, always being ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, they will be storing up real, real treasures for themselves in heaven. It is the only safe investment for eternity. 
Praise God, brothers and sisters. I want to tell you today, we can focus on money uh, way too much. We can argue on money uh, when there's no need to. Praise God. Uh, the, the Lord said right here, he said, you focus your things on heavenly things. Amen. And there'll be no better investment. There'll be no better time uh, amen, spent uh, spending your money than I say, uh, uh, like what pastor says. Amen. He comes with uh, joy. Amen. When he gets paid. Amen. To know that he gets to invest his money into the house of God. Amen. If we'll take that and we'll put it in our heart. Amen. We'll put it in our mind. Amen. I believe, uh, brothers and sisters, it'll bring happiness. Amen. To our souls. Amen. It'll bring happiness uh, to our marriages. It'll bring happiness uh, to our family life. Amen. It'll bring things. Amen. You never imagined uh, that you'd be able to have. Amen. You'll have joy in your heart for one thing. I praise God uh, because you'll be invested into the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. I believe that. I believe that uh, the investment into the kingdom of God is very important in our relationships. Yes, I believe it is. We need to teach our children this, to, to teach them to give. Amen. I, I heard Roger Lou once say, do we have to do the offering tonight? Well, do you want to do the offering? Yes, you should want to do the offering. Hey man, we need to teach these children. Uh, yes, we want to give to God. Hey man, that's a, listen, we're storing up treasures in heaven. Hey man, for an investment. We're all too happy uh, to invest in stock market exchanges and everything else that's in under the world uh, that's going to make you a dollar and put it in your pocket right now. Uh, but sometimes we're lacking when it comes uh, to giving to the, uh, to the works of God. Hey man, but I'll tell you, it'll make a difference. In your life, I can, I, I can listen. Me and Jessica testify to it. Listen, God provides. God provides financially when He, when you uh, provide to Him financially. When you put something into Him, He's not going. He promises us. He gave. He makes us promise that He's going to give it back to us, and He will. I believe that. And why? I don't even expect it, but it just comes. Amen. Sometimes. Money just ends up in my pocket, in my hand. Some words, God provides, brothers and sisters, when we give our, our, our due, uh, what we owe God. We do owe it to him, I believe. First Corinthians 7. I believe that the pastor may have hit on some of this recently, but, you know, and that's what I was talking about earlier. When when God gives you a word, don't mean that you have to to be so excited to get right on it right then. But after, you know, the, the, the messages and even on Sunday night, some the pastor has been really hitting on the body and, and then on marriages and on, on things of marriage too. And, and it was just been weighing on me. Lord, when am I going to get... To, to share this and that. Why, why, you know, I, I just want to jump up and do it. And the Lord be like, no, you're not preaching on that tonight. Uh, so, you know, God has a time for something. There's somebody that needed to, to hear this affirmation that, that the, the pastor's been preaching, amen, and what uh, uh, God is doing in your life right now. And somebody's here or online that's listening to me. Listen, put God first in our marriages, I promise you. There's nothing but good going to come out of it. First Corinthians 7 and 17. First Corinthians, I'm sorry. My glasses are fogged up. Be sure. First Corinthians chapter 7, 17. Be sure in deciding these matters that you are living as God intended, marrying or not marrying in accordance with God's direction and help and acceptance where whatever situation God has put you into. This is my rule for all the churches. For instance, a man who already has gone through the Jewish ceremony of circumcision before he became a Christian should shouldn't worry about it and if he hasn't been circumcised he should shouldn't do it now for it doesn't make any difference at all whether 
a Christian has gone through this ceremony or not. But it makes a lot of difference whether he is pleasing God and keeping God's commandments. That is the important thing. It is the important thing that, that we are living by God's commandments and what he has intended for our lives. And not going and jumping into things, as I explained to you I did earlier, but making sure, amen, by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, amen, by the leadership of the Holy Spirit, not by something that we read in a magazine or something that we read on Facebook, but leadership of the Holy Spirit that we're supposed to be doing what we're doing in life. Come on. That is the important thing. Usually a person should keep on doing, should keep on doing with the work he was doing when God called him. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But of course, if you get a chance to be free, Take it. If the Lord calls you and you are a slave, remember that Christ has set you free from this awful power of sin. And if he has called you called you, and you are free, remember that you are now a slave of Christ. You have been bought and paid for by Christ, so you belong to him. But be free now from all these earthly prides and fears so, dear brethren, whatever situation a person is in, when he becomes a Christian, let him stay there. For now the Lord is there to help him. Now I will try and answer your other question. What about girls who are not yet married? Bear with me, it's a long reading here. Uh, should they be permitted to do so? In, in answer to this question, I have no special command for them for the Lord, from the Lord. But the Lord in his kindness has given me wisdom that can be trusted, and I will be glad to tell you what I think. Here is the problem. We Christians are facing great dangers to our lives at present. In times like these, I think it is best for a person to remain unmarried. Of course, if you are already married, uh, do, don't separate because of this, but if you aren't, don't rush into it at this time. But if you men decide to go ahead anyway and get married now, it is all right. And if a girl gets married in times like these, it is no sin. However, marriage will bring extra problems that I wish you did not have to face right now. The important thing is to remember that our remaining time is very short, very short. Listen, and and so are our opportunities for doing for the Lord. Listen, it's, it's very, I, I, I like this version of this uh, the scripture, the living Bible, because of the way it words this right here. It says, for those who have wives should stay as free as possible for the Lord. Happiness or sadness or wealth should not keep anyone from doing God's work. Those in frequent contact with the Exciting things the world offers should make good use of their opportunities without stopping to enjoy them, for the world in its present form will soon be gone. Listen, I, 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 I'm not going to look for their net like that. We're living in times right now, I believe, that it, it, it's very important, amen, that we stay focused on God's work. And if, if God has just in a place, Amen. That we don't have a spouse or we don't have a significant other. Amen. It gives us that much more time. Amen. Or gives you that much. Don't give me because I'm not in this situation. Uh, but uh, it gives you that much more time, uh, Sister Leslie, uh, to perform God's work. Amen. Uh, to be about God's business here on earth. Amen. That's what we need to focus on. Uh, whether we're married or single or whatever the case may be. Amen. But we need to be focused on doing uh, what God has intended for us. Amen. To get accomplished while we're here on this earth. Amen. Because time is short. Amen as we just heard, amen. We don't never know uh, when our day is going to, when our, what day or number is going to be up, amen. We don't know when God is going to uh, say that we will not reach no more uh, boundaries past that. Uh, so we need to take every advantage, amen, of every day, amen, not be distracted, amen, from our husbands, our wives, amen, our boyfriends, our girlfriends, amen, but hey, keep our eyes on the Lord, amen, at all times.
child, amen, and keep a pressing uh, toward the mark, amen, of the, oh, the, your finish line. Amen. And a lot of times a man or woman, amen, will distract you from doing that because, as Paul said here, you'll be concerned, amen, about uh, making your wife happy, amen, or making your husband happy uh, or whoever it is that you're with happy, amen, always thinking about them. Uh, your mind will get in the way and lead you away from the Lord, amen. But this gives you t- the opportunity uh, to sp- spend time and focus on solely the Lord and the Lord alone, Amen. That's the truth. I mean, it's hard to, to tell somebody, well, you're not married. The Lord has a purpose for you. You're like, oh, man. It could be discouraging if we took it and put it that way. But if we have our mind focused on what God has intended for our life and the purpose that he has intended for our life, amen, it'll make that sailing very smooth sailing, and whether it's to be married or not to be married. If we just intend, uh, focus our uh, uh, sole po- purpose in life is to focus on what God has for us to do, then he's going to make smooth sailing for our marriages and our relationships uh, that we're in. Praise the Lord. Amen. And, and Ephesians uh, uh, 5 and 19 through 30, I'm just going to uh, kind of go over this a little bit, and it talks about communication. Amen. Uh, and what kind of communication that we're supposed to have. We need to have a godly communication, I believe, with our wife. We need to uh, have, uh, we, I love having godly communication with my wife, just be able to sit around, amen, the kitchen table and praise God and just bless his holy name and learn about his scripture together and, and dig deeper into the word of God, amen, with your wife or, or to encourage her to do uh, more for the Lord or her encouraging you uh, to do more and study more and, and to prosper in the Lord. Lord, but we have to have a good communication uh, between each other. Uh, me and my wife, sometimes we, we're not the best communicators in the world, and, and I know I need to work on communication, but we need to have a straightforward communication in between each other. But not only straightforward communication, but godly uh, communication. Amen. We, we need to take our marriages and, 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 and focus on it like we do uh, the church and other people in the church. We want to see other people grow. We want to see other people be strong in the Lord. We need to focus on our relationship that way, our marriages that way. And I, and I hope that uh, uh, that we can see that uh, and and show it's important to, to communicate with our other and significant half. I know I need to, to practice that more and become a better communicator. And, and I love being able to hear other people communicating with their wives and their husbands because it kind of teaches me a little bit about communication because I have poor communication skills. And, and it teaches me a little bit on what I need to be doing. So you all keep it work, you know, those that communicate good, because we, people learn. I learn. I, I, You know, I have a lot of faults in my life, and I love to be very transparent about it because it holds me accountable to step up and try to correct that fault. And, and you know, I do. I have bad communication skills. And that's not only my wife, that's with other people. You know, I'll be t- texting somebody, and then the next thing you know, I'll be, I don't know, over working on a tractor or something. <laughs> <laughs> and forget about what I'm doing. But I just have bad communication skills. Y'all pray for me, all right? But it's important that we have uh, that communication between our spouses. And if we don't have it, we need to figure out a way that we can learn to do it. And, and grow forward and, and not stop and stall out in our relationships and, and say, well, this is as good as it gets. It can always get better. It can always get better. You know, I said earlier in the, in the, in the beginning of the message, you know, we can bring and have uh, heaven right here on earth in our relationships and, and our general life here on earth. We can uh, ha- taste heaven right here. And I believe that, that through uh, teaching our children and teaching ourselves the the importance and uh, the responsibilities of marriage and responsibilities of husbands towards spouses and sp- uh, and wives towards their spouses is very important and and I appreciate all the the teaching that the pastor does and and by no means I know I'm no uh, can come up but you know the Lord had, had laid this on my heart a long time ago when I started counseling and and stuff to use some of this scripture that I used tonight to to lead them in going into a marriage of how to apply 
uh, God's Word to their life. And, you know, and I think it's an excellent opportunity to share God's uh, uh, Word with the people that, uh, that may be the only time that they get the opportunity to hear God's Word and see how it could affect their marriage. And, and uh, I'll be honest with you, uh, the last couple that we counseled together, he was like, man, he said, I didn't want you coming down here. How do you want, he didn't want me coming down there uh, preaching at him. And, uh, you know, this, that, and the other. But by the time we left there, by the time we left there, we, I mean, we become very good friends with this couple. And he was just so happy that, that we came. And it encouraged him to, and it encouraged him in his marriage even. It made him think about his marriage in ways that he hadn't thought about it before. So, you know, I just take it as a good opportunity to, to do that. And if y'all know anybody that would like premarital counseling, I'm not the best in the world at it, but I would like to put myself out there because I feel that God has given me some type of knowledge and I can't get it all out and, and have everything prepared like I exactly want it to be. But, you know, I have the experience and I know a lot about marriage that I need to put to use because God has given me the opportunity to do it. Amen. So I believe it's very important that we teach our children if, uh, and, uh, you know, put God first. And teach ourselves this. Put God first in all these things. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these other things, all things, I believe, all good things that come from the Lord will be added unto you. I believe it. God bless you. And uh, I love you all. Wow. Amen. How many of y'all enjoyed that? That was, that was really wonderful. And it's necessary. Man, if we, you know, if we apply some of this stuff to our heart, the Word of God just has the answer. I mean, honestly, God has left no un, no stone unturned. We don't have to go for worldly wisdom. Uh, in fact, the Bible says the foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. If God could be foolish, it would even be wiser than the most wisest that we of, of men that we walk with. And Brother Justin said some really powerful stuff. I was I was jot, jotting down notes as fast as I could get them down there. Uh, because he said some really wonderful things, and and even when it comes, I, I love, I, I teach so many times. You know, don't don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, um, and people say, well, that you know, I should be able to love whoever I want to love. Well, you can love whoever you want to love, but you can't be yoked with them. And and the reason why is is because I, I've never been in a situation where I have counseled with people who one of them was a Christian and the other one was an ungodly person that the person who was a Christian actually stayed serving God because the influence of the ungodly person is so strong and powerful in the home. And, and ungodly doesn't mean they, that they don't attend church. There's a lot of ungodly people that attend church. And, and they're Christian in face, but at home their behavior is so much different. Um, and so you have to be careful who, who you're marrying, who you're walking with. Um, the Bible says that that that... that Solomon, it describes Solomon as, as just an incredible man of wisdom. Um, but God had given them commandment before he ever became king that they should never take wives of the heathen. He said, if you do so, they'll turn your heart away from serving me. And so one of the first actions that Solomon committed when he became king is he went down to Egypt and he made a peace treaty with Pharaoh and he took to his wife one of his daughters. Now, years later, after having a thousand wives and concubines and many of them who were heathen, Solomon's heart had turned away from serving the Lord and he began to build idols in the high places for his wives. And so even though he was the wife, somebody said, I'm too smart for that. <laughs> you know, I, I love them. I'm going to marry them, but I am too smart to, to end up leaving the church. I'm too smart for that. You are not as smart as Solomon is. And it turned him away from serving the living God. And it was generationally effective because God was going to rip the entire kingdom out of the hands of David's seed. Even though David said he would, even though God promised David that he would have a seat on the throne, but it was as long as they would serve the Lord. And so as a result of David's heart, of course, Judah uh, was given unto his grandson. But because of Solomon's turning his heart from the Lord for being unequally yoked, with heathen women, 
It absolutely took all the kingdoms except for one out of the hand of his son. It devastated his son's future because his father would not abide by the word of God. Saints of God, there's no getting around it. We're not ever going to, we're never going to convince God he's wrong. He's always right. Shall not the judge of all the earth do that which is right? He's always right. And so, please, I, I, I beg of you, and, and I'm going to tell you something. If you've been a parent and you've allowed your children to hook up with ungodly kids, you know the effect. We know the effect. Come on. It wasn't, it wasn't, they didn't come running to church. All of a sudden, your children lose interest in serving God and they begin to run after the worldly things. And so it's so important that, and, and I know some of us, it's, it's difficult. Some, some of our people have been in waiting for a long time to have a spouse. But I love what Brother Justin said. It was so powerful. This is giving you time to serve the Lord. And so God may not be bringing you a spouse right now because he's got a purpose for you in this season. And he's like, look, I just need you to pay attention to me right now because it is the truth. Sister Chandra and I, we love the Lord. We love serving the Lord. But there are some times marriage can get in the way of serving God. It really does. When I have to be gone here and there and she's looking at me like, <sighs> I know you have to, but it, I don't mean I have to be happy about it. Because she loves her husband and wants to spend time with her husband. And so if God has got you single right now, you don't have a sister Chandra looking at you as you're walking out the door going, I know you have to, but I don't have to be happy about it. And so if you are single, take that time to serve the Lord. And God will send the right person. He really will. God, God knows who you need. God knows who you need. And, and you could say, oh, but Brother Jared, I've met this wonderful person and we are completely right for each other. Well, you might be right for each other, but not right now. If they're not serving God, you ain't right for each other. If they don't have the same vision you have for serving God, you're not right for each other. And it's just going to create conflict in your homes. That's all it does. It creates conflict. Because how can two walk together say they'd be agreed? So at some point, somebody's got to make the compromise. And I promise you, the ungodly one won't be the one making the compromise. They're going to stick to their guns and say, I ain't serving God. Hey, you knew me when you married me. Now all of a sudden, in order for you to keep peace in your home, what do you got to do? You have to make the compromise. And so be careful. And then when he was talking about children, it, it's so powerful. And I know it sounds crazy. Brother Justin just told us we have to push our children out. That sounds horrible. But he's 100% right. Listen, most of our children are very ill-prepared for life by the time they're adults. And it is because in many occasions, and I think we all have to be honest, I think we've all failed at that at times, is we don't see our, we don't see our responsibility to train our children to be adults. We're just taking care of them until they turn adults. And then we're hoping that somehow by the time they hit 18 from then on, they'll gather the information real quickly to be adults. And then what happens? Now they're 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 30, 35, 40, and they're still acting like children because we wasted 18 years of their life just taking care of them instead of training them. Amen. And I know people quote the scripture all the time. Well, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, make our children angry. That's not what the scripture means. Okay? Provoke not your children to wrath doesn't mean don't make your children angry. Because your children are flesh. And if you, if you discipline them because they break rules, guess what they're going to be? They're going to be angry. I can tell you, when I got whipped from my mom and daddy, I wasn't like, oh, what about that? They love me so much. Oh, my gosh, I'm so happy to have my mom and dad. They just beat the fire out of me. It's just wonderful. I got angry because they were trying to discipline my flesh to do something I didn't want to do. And so there are two types of peace you can have in your home, okay? Two types of peace. They're compromise peace, but they're peace. One is, and Sister Hannah and I were talking a little bit about this, and maybe she can share when she gets the full details on this, maybe even next week or something like that, a message that she watched. But there are two types of compromise peace in a home. 
somebody is overbearing and belligerent and they're tyrannical and they just force everyone to do the things their way. Now, there's not real peace there, but that person will have peace if everybody does it. And then there's the other side of the compromise piece where we say, well, I don't want argument or fight or conflict in my home, so therefore I'm not going to account, hold anyone accountable. My children are just going to do whatever they want, and I don't want them to be angry with me, and I don't want to have to deal with them on a constant basis. So everybody just do what you want. We'll have peace. And honestly, in, in, in most homes, those are the two different types of peace that people work with. But they're both compromised. They're both compromised. God has given, especially those, us as men, he's given us great responsibility. I talked to the brothers about that at the men's meeting, and I thought it was just great. We have great authority on our lives, incredible authority. Brothers, if you ever understood how much authority that you carry as a man, especially a man of God, you would never be afraid of the devil another day in your lifetime. I'm telling you, you would just know that God's with you. But sometimes we can use that authority to please our own selves. And that's not why God gave it to us. He gave it to us to protect our family and to guide them in the direction that the Lord would have them to go. And then sometimes as women, uh, if we're not submitted to the Lord and we're in our flesh, we can also have that overbearing spirit to where we manipulate the home to do whatever we want. And, and that's just it. Just put, I mean, you know, they say, well, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. That's ungodly. Don't you ever, don't you ever bring that concept into your home. If God ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And God ain't happy if only mama's happy. That's not what God created us for. And I love what Brother Justin said. I've always said, God didn't create women from your behind and he didn't create them from your feet. He created them from your side because we are to walk together. Amen. And so... How we raise our children is so important. And I, man, I could write a book on failure. I really could. I mean, I could sit and write you a whole novel on how not to raise your children. I could, man. We've made so many mistakes, Sister Chandra and I have. And, and, and we have made so many bad choices and decisions for them because we we're under pressure. But understand, we can take discipline too far or we cannot take it far enough. It is discipline, not revenge. It is discipline, not vengeance. So take, for instance, Cameron, come up here real quick. Amen. Praise God. He's awake now. Praise God. Hallelujah. He's been awake this whole service. I'm so proud of you. He's growing up, y'all. He gets so big. <laughs> but I, I didn't bring Xander here because I didn't want him to have to come down here, but Say Cameron is my biological son, all right? Now, I've adopted him. He is my spiritual son. So he got to deal with his spiritual dad every once in a while. But my job for Cameron is not to make him please me. My responsibility to Cameron is to make him please God. So Cameron back talks me or Cameron does something I tell him not to do. And I'm angry. I'm letting into Am I letting into him because he displeased God? Or am I letting into him because he made me mad and I'm exacting my revenge? That's not training. You're not disciplining your children when you are when you are when you are being vindictive and you are you you are committing an act of revenge against them. That's not discipline. Discipline is to say all right, Cameron, the Bible says, honor your father and mother. Your days shall be long upon the earth, which the Lord our God shall give you. In fact, that is the first commandment with promise. And so when Cameron disrespects his parent, I don't come at him because he made me mad or he did something to me. Cameron sinned against God. And so my job is to discipline him so that he repents for his action that he committed against God, not against me. Now, does that mean that, well, so you're saying we don't spank our children? No, because the rod of correction drives foolishness out of his heart. That rod of correction is consequence. But don't you ever, listen, as 
God has helped me. I, I, have, I have tried my best to never, ever discipline my children in my anger. Because then it's, it's not about discipline. It's about retribution. You discipline your children in your hot anger, you are just, you, there's no discipline there. Let's not call it discipline. You're just attacking them for making you mad. It's reality. And that's when situations become abusive. When you're attacking them because you are angry at them because they made you mad, that is when you're going to go too far. And so I would say, hey, Cameron, go to your room. Because I'm mad right now. And I will snatch you bald. I swear. Oh, God. If I deal with you right now, I don't know if you will live to see tomorrow. You don't ever, you don't ever react to your children's behavior. You calm yourself and discipline them. Because a child, listen, if God, if children could raise parents, then children would be having parents, not parents having children. And so if you think your little baby is so intelligent and smart that they can actually tell you things that make sense, then maybe you were never mature yourself. It's your job to teach them what is right and wrong, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. It's not their job to tell you. So it's training children of God. I wished, I wished, at 40 years old, I wished I knew now, or then what I knew now. If, if I could just take myself back to that 24-year-old, 25-year-old guy and be like, hey, dude, you are going to mess this thing totally up because I would, but I can't. So what we do is we counsel people from failure. Really, most counsel is done from failure, not success. So when I look at my child and I say, man, you've backtalked me or, or you've lied, you've stolen, you've cheated. Well, all of those things are breaking of the commandments of the Lord. That's what they are. They sinned against God. It was an attack on me. It doesn't devalue me. The reason why most of the time we react in such hot anger toward our children is because we feel like they're devaluing us. How can a child devalue an adult? How? When all of your stock is in that child. That's not fair to them. They're not, listen, they're not your bestie. Your children will never be your bestie until they're adult enough to not call you mommy and daddy. Until you're not paying their bills. Until you're not making sure that they, food, that they, they can't. Listen, I love my parents now and my parents are my friends. I care for my parents deeply. They're my friends my dad is my friend. My mom is my friend. They're not my mommy and daddy anymore. I don't depend on them for anything. I really don't. You want to know why? Because they raised me to be independent. But now I can spend time with them as friends because I'm an adult now. But I can promise you I wasn't my mom and dad's best friend when I was growing up. They loved me as their child, but I wasn't their best friend because there were times they were going to have to discipline me. And that, their emotional need for me. You should never emotionally need your children. Ever. If your emotional need for your children is so high that if you displease them, it upsets you, you've got a real issue there. And you need to start disconnecting yourself from that. Not that you don't need to be connected emotionally. They just can't fulfill your emotional needs. They can't do it. And if, if that's the case, come to Jesus and let Jesus begin to fulfill that place. Here. You're asking a little child to fulfill the emotional needs of an adult? That's unfair. And most of the time, the relationship that people have with their children are corrupted when the parent has an emotional need for the child. They need you. You don't need them. You can't have that kind of relationship. If you need that, come to Jesus. Be a part of the body of Christ. Get your strength from there. Get your emotional needs met from the body. Do not put that burden. It is an unfair, unwarranted, and it is an absolute burden they are incapable of ever bearing. Because your job is not to always see them just happy. Oh, it just makes me happy for you to be happy. Your job is to train them. At some point, they're going to be adults and they're going to either love you because you raised them or they're going to hate you because you failed them. Well, I took, listen, I took them to the park every day. I went to Chuck E. Cheese. I took them to the arcade. We went and watched movies. I took them here. I mean, we did all kinds of stuff. I, I went to every ball game. I went, but if you're not training them, if they become an adult and go, 
I don't know how to live as an adult. They're not going to look at you and remember all the times you went to the park, Chuck E. Cheese, went to the ball game. They're not going to remember that. They're going to remember the fact that you did not take the time to train them to live without you. And the only reason why you will not train your children to live without you is because you have, a, you have an obscure emotional need for them. When parents will not train their children to live without, listen, I hope to God my children don't die before me. I pray that my children far outlive me. And if that is the case, I won't be here forever and they're going to have to live without me. So we train them. Anything outside of that, really, and, and, and again, Sister Hannah will share with you, I, I pray maybe in the upcoming weeks uh, what she talked to me about today. Anything outside of that is just witchcraft, saints. We're just playing with devils, really, is what we're doing. Because anything outside the authority of God, and again, it's not about you being some overbearing, domineering male who walks into your house and just says, by God, this is the way it's going to happen. Come hell or high water. You love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And sisters, it's not about you always getting your way either. It's not about me being pleased as a husband. It's not about Sister Chandra being pleased as a wife. It's about God being pleased with our marriage. How much more peace could you have than to know that you are pleasing God with your marriage? And we need to do that, and we need to get that in our children. I really, I'm praying... I would really like to see a lot of you parents have your children standing next to you during worship and teaching them how to worship. I, I realize that sometimes in the messages, things are deep and they go over their head and sometimes they'll color and do different things like that. I don't have a problem with that at, at a certain age. There is a certain age they can start to understand. But I would love while worship is going on, get your children and bring them beside you. Don't let them sit down. Don't let them cover their heads up. Don't let them be on game systems and all that stuff. While we're worshiping, get that child beside you. Grandparents, if you've got grandchildren here, get your grandchildren beside you. You know how I learned to worship? I did not learn to worship because it just somehow was bestowed upon me magically by some fairy that God sent to sprinkle dust over my head. And my dad, thank God he's serving God right now, but he didn't for years. And so I, I didn't have my dad to teach me how to worship at that time, but it was because somebody cared enough to say, you know what? Kids, listen, when I was growing up, kids couldn't sit together in church because we talked to them and, and passed notes. Amen. We sat with adults. But the benefit of that was that I was standing next to someone or sitting next to someone. One of, one of, one of the, men's that, uh, the men that early men's, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Let's reel that one back and wash that thing. And <laughs> but one of the men <laughs> that taught me how to worship was Earl Grissom. You all don't know him, but he was an elder brother in the church. And he died when I was very young. Maybe Cameron's age is when he passed away. And he passed away in the church. But I would sit by Brother Earl a lot during service. And that man worshiped God. And so a lot of my demonstrative worship came from Brother Earl Grissom. Because as a little child, I was learning how to worship God. You know, come on, somebody. And you say, but they're too young. They're not too young. Not too young. I got the Holy Ghost when I was seven years old. Come on, get off that mess. Have that child stand around. Don't let them play. Don't, I'm talking about during worship. Don't let them do all that stuff. During worship, stand them beside you and then teach them how to worship God. Teach them how to bless the name of the Lord. Teach them how to magnify God. Because again, the greatest thing you'll ever give to your child is an example of a relationship with Christ. That's training, amen? And we want to bless our children. We want to encourage our children to serve God, to love the house of God. Parents, sometimes I know, I realize that sometimes our flesh can over overtake us and we can get tired. And, I don't want to go to church. Don't say that stuff in front of your kids. Don't belittle the church. Don't badmouth the church. Don't belittle the pastor. Don't badmouth the pastor. Don't talk about the work of God with, with ugliness in your spirit. You want to know why? Because someday your little baby's going to get in trouble and they're going to need somebody and you're going to run to the pastor in the church that you absolutely tore down in front of them and say, hey, can you help them? And by the time we get to them, they're not going to trust anything we have to say because you tore us down before we got there.
I love what Brother Justin said about giving to the church. That's not religious manipulation. Are you out of your mind? That is absolute obedience to the word of God, knowing that I'm pleasing God financially. Your whole life should be, Lord, am I pleasing you? Is this pleasing you? I want to make sure you've done so much for me. You died for me on a cross. You bore my sins. You took my pain, my sorrow. You did everything. All this stuff for me and you're going to come back for me. Lord, is this pleasing you? Because when you come back, I just want to know I did what was right because I want to hear you say, well done. And I got to give my mama some flowers because my mother, uh, she's been serving God for many years now. And my mother was very, very devout in the work of God, very devout. And I will have to also give to my dad. My dad never stood in the way of my mother teaching us about the Lord or raising us in the church or even us going to the Christian school. He never stood in her way. He always, he always supported that. And uh, even though he wasn't in church, got to give that to him. He really, he really never, ever hindered that. But my mother has been a godly woman. And I know some of you sisters, maybe your husbands are not in church. Maybe you're single mothers and you think, whoa, you know, this is a lot to bear. But my mother was faithful to God. My mother prayed. When we got up for school in the morning, you know what? My mother did not have the television on. We had a record player in, uh, in our house. And, and, man, we had one of them floor heaters, too. Y'all don't know nothing about those. Well, you run across them at the wrong time, and you will be calling on the name of the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Don't ever run across a barefoot. Praise God. But... My mother would have Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir records on while we were getting ready for school in the morning. And she was, she was helping us and teaching us to acknowledge God right when we got up in the morning. She kept the presence of the Lord covering our house. She drug us to church every single service. There wasn't, no, I don't want to go. My mama was like, no, until you are old enough to take care of your own self, you don't get to make that decision. You're coming to church. And she didn't care if it made us happy or sad or angry or frustrated. She was like, that's not my job. My job is not always to make you happy, but to teach you what is right. My mother played in the band. She did usheretting. She, she did all kinds of stuff. I mean, she just, you know, and, and she permitted the men of the church to have influence in our life to help us and to train us to serve God. And so you parents, you single mothers, you mothers that have, don't have your husbands here, don't, don't think, don't think that it's too much for you. Don't think it's too much for you. Girls, girls, stop. Don't think it's too much for you. Don't think it's too much for you. It is not too much for you. God will help you. Let the church help you. Let these mothers and these grandmothers help you. I I love the fact that we have such a different, diverse age group in here. You want to know why? Because we got grandmothers in here. We got mothers in here. We got fathers and grandfathers in here. And I want you all to look at our children like that. Love them dearly. We have some wonderful children in here. I mean, just blessed children here. And and I'm going to tell you something. Uh, I I do think that Gloria is going to outsing her mother. I'm just going to tell you because that girl can flat out sing. She just can't sing. She can sing. But we need to take people like her. We need to take people like dear Kaisha that... God has given to us. She's a blessing to this church. And God has put her in Sister Rita's care, but also in the church's care to help her to raise the serve of the Lord. And she's going to be a great gift in the body of Christ. I look at these boys. I look at all of our children, all of our girls. God's given them talent and ability. Teach them to use it for Jesus. Teach them to be a vessel for Jesus. And God will take them further than they ever thought. Anyways, that, that's my spill. I, I just wanted to back Brother Justin up on that and just add a few things. God wants us to glorify him in every area of our life. So just to rehash that a little bit, parents, please don't ever discipline your children because you're angry. Don't ever do it. You're not teaching them to repent. You're teaching them to go into protection. It's what you're teaching them. They're protecting themselves. They're not getting the message of your discipline. But if you're angry, send them away. Now, if they won't quit arguing with you, amen, take about 10 seconds, breathe real deeply, paddle that rear end and say, go back to your room. 
All right? Make, make sure that you're doing it God's way. How many of y'all are glad God doesn't discipline us in his hot anger? Oh, Jesus. Oh, oh, where would we be? Where would we be? But God knows what we need. And I thank Brother Justin for being a vessel used for God today. Amen. I think Sister Ashley's testimony was just absolutely wonderful. Amen. Tap out is coming, Sister Ashley. Tap out is coming. The enemy's going to get beat. He's going to lose. He's already lost. He just didn't realize it yet. But there's coming a day he will. This has been an awesome night in the house of God. What a great day we have had. Amen. I love times of shouting and rejoicing and turning backflips and dancing and running. But then, man, having these times to just sit down and just receive instruction and direction. These are awesome times. It all works together for our good, doesn't it? All right, we're going to give our tithes and our offerings. Amen. I can't wait to get into the ministry of giving. Zan, bring that up. Bring that graphic up real quick. Again, guys, Sister Cheryl, do you remember what we started out with just about two and a half years ago? The debt, was it 52000 53000 something like that. So can you imagine in just two and a half years, we paid this down to $22,351. That's, and, and what y'all don't know is our, our, our payment on the church is already paid up through April. Look, we're not being reckless. We're being good stewards of the finances that God brings into this place. But I believe, Brother David was talking to me today about tax returns. He's like, Pastor, he's like, you had about 20 of us given $1,000 off our tax return. Because some of y'all are getting some tax returns. Praise God, I ain't even tried mine yet. I'm just believing God. Hallelujah. <laughs> You imagine if we all do everything that we can, just like the churches in Macedonia, Lord, not only what we can afford, but even beyond that, this church will be paid off. Amen. How wonderful would that be? How wonderful. And we will be able to say just six years later from being totally destitute and having nothing, God has allowed us to purchase our own property free and clear. Amen. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be awesome? Just two, can you imagine? Three years would be in October, right? Am I correct about that? Three years would be in October. August, I'm sorry, August. Three years would be in August. Three years in August. And this church is already very close to being paid for. Can you imagine God did that for us? It's awesome. Amen. So let's all say, Lord, whatever you put in our hands. We're going to make sure it goes back to you because as the churches of Macedonia, I told Brother David, I can see Paul. These people were incredibly poor. They were horribly impoverished. They were in times of destitution and drought. But they were so excited about being able to help the saints of God, which were in Jerusalem, that they begged him to take the money. Because I'm sure Paul was standing there saying, guys, this is too much. You all are struggling. This is too much. And they said, oh, no, Paul, please, please, please. I'm begging you, take this money to Jerusalem because we want to be a part of the ministry of giving. God, let that be all of our hearts. Let that be all of our hearts. Father God, in the name of Jesus. Oh, what a night. I feel your presence and your anointing. I feel the absolute power of God in this place. Lord, now we come to give to you. Lord God, let us give not just what we can't afford, but let us give, God, from our hearts joyfully, God, all that which you have asked from us. Let us do it with rejoicing, knowing that there are promises attached to our obedience. God, let us be a part of the ministry of giving tonight. Bless those that can, Lord. Bless them abundantly as you watch over your word to perform it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, stand to your feet. Let's bring our offering, our tithes before the Lord.
word of God. Amen. The announcements are the same as they were this morning, so we won't go through all of them. If you need to know, you can come up here and take a picture. I want to continue to remember all those who are sick. We mentioned many of them. Uh, Sister Margaret Fleener posted that we want, she asked if we would pray for her son. And Sister Margaret has been, has visited the church several times, especially when I think we were over on um, New Beesonwell, or Old Beesonwell. So I want to pray for her. I want to continue to pray for Brother Calvin. Uh, all those who are sick need a prayer. Yeah, my cousin Michelle, please pray for her. She really needs prayer. She's in very critical condition. And we want to pray for her sister, Rose Williamson. Uh, she is doing so much better. Um, it's, it's really a miracle. It is a miracle what God has done in her life to bring her off that ventilator, to bring her into a place of where now she's talking and eating and some of her strength's coming back. And so we thank God for that. Um, when it's not your time, saints, it's not your time. But when it is, it is. So we don't, we don't charge God either way. Good is the will of the Lord. Um, I'm trying to think. Remember, kids, no school tomorrow? Amen. Huh? I'm sorry. You're working at home tomorrow. So get your work done tomorrow. Don't bring, don't bring stuff back to the school undone saying, I don't know, I thought we were off on Monday. Working home. Um, is there any announcements that I'm missing? All right, we'll be back here Wednesday night. Looking forward to an awesome time in the Lord. I'm trying to think, I'm, I'm missing something, but God help me. Prayer for somebody. Yeah, let's continue to pray for uh, Lydia, the God toucher. Sister Rosemary, uh, she is on her way home, uh, Brother Jimmy's mother, so let's pray for her that God would cover her and protect her. All right, what an awesome night. What an awesome night. What an awesome night. Looking forward to Wednesday already. Amen. All right, saints, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for this honor and opportunity we've had to be in your house. Thank you for the words that we've heard, God. Our hearts, Lord God, are indicting a good matter. Our tongue is as the pen of a ready writer. That we might speak for those things which are so good, God. So pleasant, Lord. So wonderful, God. Help us to apply the word of God to our heart that we've heard tonight, God. And help us to be the people that will please you. Father, watch over us and keep us. We pray for those who are sick. We pray for those who are needing deliverance, help, strength, encouragement healing God. Lord, perform your great word concerning them. Father, be with us and watch over us. Keep us as we leave this place. Keep us till we come back at the next appointed time, Lord God. Use us this week, God, to tell somebody about you that somebody might come running saying, what must I do to be saved? Father, keep us throughout the week. Keep us safe. God will give you praise, glory, and honor for all of it. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you, saints. Go with God. Have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday night. Amen.